1957. Christmas Island in the Pacific. Britain tests its first hydrogen bomb dropped by a Vickers Valiant V bomber. After the Second World War, the Soviet Union, a former ally to the West, closed its borders and created the Soviet bloc under its leader, Joseph Stalin. This created huge mistrust between East and West and developed into the Cold War. To counter this mistrust, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, was founded in 1949, which included 12 nations headed by the United States, Canada, France, and Britain. Should any member be attacked, the other members were obliged by treaty to join in its defense. Now the mechanics of European defense are welded under General Eisenhower and his air chief, Air Chief Marshal Saunders who has the task of coordinating the growing efforts of all our neighbor lands to build their air strength. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization ignores the land frontiers so that each may be inviolate. Our contribution is ourselves and our brothers of the Commonwealth, the Canadians, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the South Africans. Until 1950, Britain's RAF Bomber Command was still equipped with the piston-engine Lincoln Heavy Bomber and American Washingtons. After the war, Britain decided to jump production straight from the Lincolns and the Lancasters to the Jets. In the early 50s, Britain's aircraft industry was composed of separate companies all vying for contracts. And the RAF's new heavy jet bombers were still virtually on the drawing board. At Vickers with the Valiant, Avro, the Vulcan, and Hanley Page with its proposed Victor. And now the jet bombers of the RAF are coming along. The Canberra is coming into squadron service. A sleek thing more beautiful to the eye than to the ear, which can fly twice as fast as the Lincoln and twice as high. The RAF's tremendously powerful weapon to come is the Valiant, the new four-jet bomber, a magnificent example of British engineering. The jet engines inside the wings made the aeroplane look amazingly clean and streamlined. Astonishingly, because these aircraft didn't come cheap, we thought we would have two super V-bombers. They were called V-bombers because we thought the names would begin with a V, Vulcan and Victor. And then, in case these were a little bit too radical and were late, we thought, well, we'll have a slightly simpler aeroplane, the Vickers Valiant. And then we thought, well, in case that is a little bit delayed, we'd better have an even simpler one and we invented the short Sperrin, named after some mountains in Northern Ireland. Here's the SA-4, the first new bomber out of Short Brothers since the wartime stern. It has four Rolls-Royce Avon turbojets in double mountings, a business-like aircraft with speed, load and armament still very much on the secret list. The Valiant was a betwixt and between. It wasn't as early and simple as the short SA-4 Sperrin. But using basically the same engines, four Rolls-Royce Avons buried inside the wings in the case of the Valiant, we thought we would have an aeroplane that could be brought into use relatively quickly. Relatively quickly was a cross to bear for the Vickers Armstrong's design team at Weybridge and at Fox Warren in Surrey because Everybody said, well, it's quite simple. It's not as difficult as the Avro Vulcan or the Handley Page Victor. You can do it very quickly. <laughs> and that's hard. And in fact, Sir George Edwards' design team, they pulled out all the stops and they did brilliantly to have the first Valiant flying in May 1951. In fact, they flew before the so-called simple short sparing. The Valiant 
was achieved incredibly quickly and everything went very well until quite some way into the program the first Valiant caught fire in the air. Now the fire was in one of the engine bays inside the root of the wing and it was a bay where A you couldn't see what was happening, there was no fire warning and there was no extinguishing system. The arrangements for the crew were that the two pilots sat side by side in ejection seats. Behind were three seats facing aft, which were not able to eject, so you had to open a door and get out, and that wasn't too easy. This aircraft had to be abandoned in emergency in flight, and the pilots banged out, but I believe people in the back didn't. The first Valiant was distinguished by engines that couldn't be seen, they were inside the root of the wing, and they were fed by a thin slit in the leading edge. It was a marvellous scheme, it gave minimum drag, and because of the design, it also gave you a large wing area, which was just what you needed for good performance at extreme altitude, and we're talking about 50,000 feet or more. In 1919, the Vimy, first Vickers heavy bomber, sets out on the first non-stop transatlantic flight. Early days of World War II. Day and night, the Vickers Wellington is a familiar sight on bomber stations throughout the country. mid-century, the latest Vickers bomber takes over, the four-engined Valiant. Its high-speed, high-altitude performance, overall power and handsome outline proclaiming its jet age origin. In flight or on the ground, the overall sweep back and eager lines of the Valiant suggest high speed. Four engines buried in the deep wing are fed in pairs through leading edge intakes, the outlets protruding slightly from the trailing edge. The early Vimy was fitted with Rolls-Royce Eagle engines. Carrying on the connection, four Rolls-Royce Avons form the Valiant's power plant. wing area simplifies takeoff and landing. Double slotted flaps along the trailing edge help to make possible a low speed range remarkable in view of the bomber's size. In a slow run over the airfield, she displays her excellent aerodynamic form, sleek, handsome, to all appearances motorless. You're not likely to come across a Valiant at this range, but watch out in these simple views for the basic characteristics in flight. tapered torpedo of the fuselage, appearing a little less slender than it actually is because of the very deep wing root core. The high set wing, providing for a capacious load of conventional bombs, or today's alternative of an atom weapon. The shape of this wing is probably the most useful clue to the Valiant's identity. A great tapered surface with slight sweep back, leading edge strongly tapered on the center section, diminishing towards the blunt tips. Remember the way those thickened roots can give a look of anhedral to the flattened wing. The flatness repeated in the tailplane set nearly halfway up the fin. The tail unit is large and bold, combining the graceful curve of the extended fin with the flat top and angular rudder. The level top controls the backward leaning appearance of the tail unit as a whole.
In spite of its size, the Valiant's sheer outline can present a recognition problem. Clues, obvious enough at this range, must be built up into an impression of the aircraft as a whole, an impression to be retained as detail disappears, or from the ground as a distant Valiant breaks through cloud. As speed and height records increase, the observer's job becomes more difficult. It takes a trained eye to spot, in a split second, the long tapered fuselage, the high, flat, swept wing with its diminishing taper. From these and the impression of effortless power, he'll name the Vickers Valiant. I think in 1953 or 54, Vickers came along with the valve and it looked impressive. The fuselage was slightly longer, but the big change was instead of having tandem wheels which retracted sideways inside the wing, there were proper bogey landing gears with four wheels on each leg, which retracted backwards into streamlined blisters, exactly the arrangement later adopted by the Russians. It became a sort of Russian trademark. Why? Well, it was a heavier aeroplane, that's why it needed a new landing gear, and it was heavier because the structure was completely restressed. The original Valiant was designed to fly at high altitude. The black one, properly, pro, generally known as the Pathfinder, was designed to fly at maximum speed at low level. In fact, the sea level speed of the ordinary Valiant was I think 450 odd miles per hour, whereas the speed of the B Mark II, the Pathfinder, was 552, where the missiles couldn't get locked on quick enough. The Black Valiant would have been perfect. Surrey, the famous Brooklyn circuit, birthplace of British motor racing, has become an aerodrome. The conversion was made to help production of the Vickers Valiant, the medium-range jet bomber, now top priority for the RAF. Vickers did a splendid job in producing the Valiant under intense pressure, very quickly. They delivered 108 aircraft in something like, well it was certainly less than two years. And by 1955, 2320CU I think it was, at Gaydon in Warwickshire, were up and running training crews and of course training the ground. And not long after that, 138 Squadron became the first operational Valiant unit. Haleybury was a school with a very great service tradition. The sort of place that if you want to go in the army, you were sort of pointed at Sandhurst. If you want to go in the navy, you went to Dartmouth. So when I said I wanted to fly, I was vectored towards Cranwell. It was a three year course in those days. We did uh, three terms, in other words, a year on the Piston Engine Provost. And then we graduated to the Vampire. The and I graduated from Cranwell in December of 1957. By then, the number of chaps on the course had been reduced to 25. About half went to the Hunter, uh, and I and a number of other guys went to the V4. Some went to the Vulcan, and some went to the Valiant. Uh, the Valiant OCU was at Gaydon and we did quite a lot of flights out of Gaydon uh, in the training role and then we were joined by the rear crew members who came for the last few sorties and we all went back to Marham then and suddenly I was in a, in a crew. The flying consisted of uh, navigation exercises and uh, practice uh, bombing missions which was done using the radar bombing system, because we didn't actually drop a weapon, but it was all done by radar, and they, they back-plotted where you were in the air at the point you released your weapon and where it would have hit. The Bomber Command bombing competition was the highlight uh, of my time there, and we all sort of trained up for that. And I think in about 1960, we actually won the bombing competition, my squadron, 207, and I think my own crew was second in the individual performance. One of the targets I thought was a bit sacrilegious was the northeast corner of the Aston Martin um, 
a factory in somewhere like Feltham or something in the, in the, in the home counties. <laughs> Little did they know that, they, <laughs> that they, were, they were being used as a practice target in those days. The Valiant really, like any bomber, was designed around its bomb bay. The Valiant bomb bay contains six stations. Station one for a five bomb carrier, forward lower position. Station two for a three bomb carrier, in the forward upper position. Station three for one 10,000 pound bomb only. Station four for a five bomb carrier in the lower center position. Station five for a three bomb carrier, rear upper position. Station six for a five bomb carrier, rear lower position. The original idea was 1,000 pounders. At the missile preparation building, the NCO guides the tractor driver along the center line marked on the floor to position the bomb trolleys directly below the hoisting gantry. The NCO controls the raising of the five bombs until cleared of the SABT. The armorers insert the lower roller assembly. This fits onto the cradle to provide movement for the two lower bombs. After the load has been lowered onto this assembly, the two lower bombs are disconnected from the hoisting sling. The three upper bombs can now be raised to permit the armorers to insert the upper roller assembly. Tail units can now be located and locked into position. The NCO raises the carrier and moves the gantry until the carrier is directly above the first clutch of bombs. The cocking test indicator is now used to check that the release units are correctly cocked. The load is raised clear of the transporter cradle to allow the armorers to remove the lower roller assembly. Finally, the load is again lowered on the cradles of the SABT, the sling disconnected, and transit straps are fitted. At this stage, nose fusing would be affected if required. The load can now be dispatched to the aircraft. The gantry transports a hydraulic jack and positions it over the aircraft to raise or lower carriers into the bomb bay. All hydraulic controls are operated by the driver. Here, approaching a Valiant aircraft, are three standard airfield bomb transporters carrying a full load of 21 1,000 pound MC Mark VI dummy bombs. As such, they are not fused or utilizing the fusing units on the carriers. Transit straps are removed at this stage. The crane gantry is driven up to the aircraft forward of the main plane and the NCO will ensure that the bomb doors are open and tripped. The first SABT, the one with the two three-bomb carriers, is positioned using the inching gear until the transporter is immediately below station two. By means of the intercom, the NCO guides the gantry so that the ram is positioned immediately above the closure hatch. He also ensures that the gantry does not foul the aircraft. The NCO now checks that the bomb aimer's panel in the navigator's position has both start and stop switches in the off position. Meanwhile, the armorer has installed the two hoist tubes and now connects the piston to the lifting rod. The driver is instructed to select raise. This causes the cylinder to travel down over the locking sleeve until it mates with the compression tube. The NCO details the driver to select neutral. The armorer is instructed to raise and retain the operating handle, and the NCO instructs the driver to select lower. Here you see the release unit adapter, the H-piece, the lifting eye, and the lifting rod and torque tube assembly being lowered clear of the release unit housing. After the carrier has been coupled to the release unit adapter, a cocking test indication is carried out. The driver is detailed to select raise. The NCO steadies the carrier and watches that the two butting connector towers mate with their opposite halves on the aircraft. This is extremely important. The operating handle will assume the locked position automatically and the armorer informs the NCO who instructs driver to retain lever in the raised position. 
The second SABT is now inched in until the load is immediately below station one. This is the forward lower carrier position and still forward of the aircraft center of gravity. The gantry is now moved a few feet until the ram is immediately above this forward station. The ram connections and lowering for coupling are carried out as for the previous load. Here is the second clutch being hoisted. The lower stations, of which there are three, are fitted with lower carrier adapters. In a like manner, the remaining load is positioned below station six, the rear lower carrier. Before hoisting, a further cocking test is made. The driver is instructed to select raise. The NCO carefully supervises the hoisting operation. This will complete the full load of 21 1,000 pound bombs. A live bomb notice is placed on the aircraft. The basic load of the Valiant was various clusters of 1,000 pounders or in fact incendiaries. What used to happen was used to take off, fly uh, quite long navigation legs including the bombing runs that we did and then we used to finish up in circuit doing circuits and bumps um, and that was when one really got one's hands on the machine and uh, used to take it turn and turn about and do ILSs, asymmetric stuff and re restricted flap and all sorts of things like that. So most of our missions were round about uh, what five six hours in the course of a day spent with the RAF, the Premier flew to the Bomber Command Station at Wittering, North Hants, and was it raining? Sir Anthony seemed to take little notice of the weather. Anyhow, he carried on with his programme. His visit was strictly informal, and he talked with the Valiant's crew, as well as with the maintenance men, and inspected the big bomber. Its wings provided a little shelter, but it may perhaps have been this stormy day that contributed to the influenza that overtook him shortly afterwards. It was decided that the centre, the sort of uninhabited heartland of Australia, could be used for testing big rockets, large missiles, and even nuclear weapons. And Edinburgh Field near Adelaide was the airfield used for the Canberras and Valiants. And Maralinga was the name of the place where things were dropped or where missiles were shot to. Operation Buffalo took place in the autumn of 1956 on the new atomic proving ground at Maralinga in South Australia, 600 miles from Adelaide. This is the village of Maralinga, with the headquarters, living accommodation, power stations and laboratories. Another five miles up the road, we arrive at the target response area. From here, we can see the tower from which the first weapon was let off. It was a few tens of kilotons. Maralinga problem was that we couldn't be sure there weren't people there and in fact we did do nuclear testing. We now move to the spectator's stand five miles from ground zero looking now towards the tower which will be ground zero. Here are the service indoctrinee observers coming up. About five minutes before the time we turned our backs and the countdown started as we waited a little apprehensively for our first atomic explosion. Three seconds to go. And there is the fact. After two seconds, we turned round. Fantastic sight. Remember, there is still no sound. Quite silent. The blast and sound took 20 seconds to reach us. And you will see it here against the trousers of the spectators. Now, it's difficult to believe there is no sound yet. There is Grand Zero. There's no crater, but there is a rather sinister grey-green area around where the tower was. This is the fused sand where the fireball has touched the ground. The tower has completely disappeared. Now we're preparing for round two, which was a small ground burst weapon, a good deal smaller than the first one, let off between two towers. 
go of the spectators and the fantastic flash again and round they come and there it goes it looked to start with like a very heavy demolition charge this is viewed from two miles and it was some time before it developed its mushroom shape and at least one weapon was dropped there from by a valiant the fourth and last round here you see the valiant aircraft which dropped the small airburst weapon Spectators are forming up now for this airburst run. It's again a lovely clear day and you notice the cloud effects in the sky as the shock wave goes out. Again, this gives a typical airburst effect. Rather cleaner looking fireball with more vivid colouring rising rapidly into the air. As the equipment is dispatched and the teams take their departure, a silence settles once more over Maralinka. It was in the House of Commons that the government's decision was announced following Israel's advance into Egypt. Sir Anthony said, Britain and France have called upon Egypt and Israel to stop all warlike action forthwith and to withdraw their military forces to a distance of 10 miles from the canal. He also indicated possible action to separate the belligerents and to guarantee freedom of transit through the canal. Egypt rejected the request that Anglo-French forces should temporarily move to key positions at Port Said, Ismailia and Suez. I think October 1956 saw General Nasser take charge in, in Egypt and he said the Suez Canal is Egyptian, you English and, and French can jolly well get out, it's an Egyptian canal, you will no, no longer have a, a British and French company, the Suez Canal company is henceforth wound up. Now today I think we would try and sit down the table but the immediate response then was for the heads of government of Britain and France to get together and say these people cannot behave like this, we will bomb them. And that's just what we arranged. The strike on Suez I felt was, was right. Su Suez came very early in uh, my career on balance anyhow. We, we had been on the squadron six, less than six months in actual fact and in truth of fact, I had not got our complete kits of um, MBS until the urgency of the Suez situation brought a rapid re uh, fit fitment of, of this equipment, which of course please does not end. The squadron was a buzz at the time because nobody on the squadron knew where we were going to deliver our weapons, whether we were going to be on the Egyptians or on the uh, Israelis who were invading the Egyptian territory from the east at the time. Now over to Cairo. It was Colonel Nasser, Egypt's dictator, who seized the canal over two months ago. His army has recently been strengthened by the provision of arms and equipment from behind the Iron Curtain. Great Britain instituted special troop movements at the time of the canal seizure. The Suez Canal had been built by the French and the British and the right of usage was being taken away by Nasser. They were not called upon in that emergency, but they have remained ready for action. The Royal Navy played a leading part throughout the concentration. France, though heavily engaged in Algeria, has also been on the alert in the eastern Mediterranean. An agreement was reached with Britain some time ago to station some of her forces in Cyprus. That island is indeed a strategic base for Middle East operations. Reinforcements of British troops have been stationed here in readiness for any sudden call upon their services. We sent Canberras to Malta and Cyprus 
And then we even sent out some of the first Valiants to become operational. And they were loaded up with thousand pound HE, real ones. And together with the Canberras, we set about bombing the Egyptians. Three squadrons, two from uh, Marham and one from Whitley, flew operations from Malta. Ships of the Mediterranean fleet have been in support throughout the crisis. Acting as transports and escorts, they played an important role in the strengthening of Britain's Middle East garrisons and they are prepared for whatever action may be necessary. The Anglo-French decision to act was duly implemented and operations began with air attacks on military objectives in Egypt. I think we each flew two trips. One, the first night we flew to Cabrit to bomb the, uh, the runway there and put the airfield out of service. And one of the oft-quoted stories is that the Egyptian air traffic controllers saw the Valiants coming and called up the first one and gave them useful headings saying your course to steer is so and so and the Valiant captain felt extremely embarrassed because he was about to let go his load. It was something like uh, an old bomber command exercise. We flew, we didn't fly at the maximum height we could have done, we flew in line astern, something like three minutes between each aircraft. During the trip into Cabrit, the lead aircraft was attacked by a meteor which was practically hung from his, his nose in the sky firing up at the Valiant. But on receiving this fire, the lead pilot passed a message back and the entire force climbed to well above 40,000 feet. The second, the next night we flew uh, to a place called El Agami, which preferred to be a naval base of some, perhaps for submarines. The first night we bombed visually, the nav plotter doing the bombing from their visual position. The second night we bombed on radar. None of them did hit the, the airfield except which was the target, the runway. But we did a good job of uh, damaging all these aircraft which were parked around the airfield in storage. The aim is to preserve the free use of the canal and to restore law and order in the Middle East. In theory, the Suez campaign should have been an open and shut case. We should have simply bombed the Egyptians out of existence so that they said, oh, ever so sorry chaps, uh, yes, the Suez Canal is yours. But the Americans said, you know, you British and French really shouldn't behave like this. We think it's about time you pulled back and said sorry. And after a bit of negotiating, the Prime Minister entered the Eden and said, oh dear, we made a mistake, P but stop, stop it chaps, um, go back to square one. They did, of course, on the Valiant, have uh, uh, do experiments with ro rocket-assisted takeoff. <laughs> Vickers Valiants, the most powerful bombers in service with the RAF, are being fitted with auxiliary rocket engines to assist takeoff. With the help of these Super Sprite boosters, the Valiant now needs only a small runway to become airborne. For the Valiant, de Havilland went to town with an enormous package called the Super Sprite in which you could inject kerosene to give extra thrust. The Vickers Valiant, shown at Farnborough, was fitted with two de Havilland Super Sprite liquid fuel rocket engines. It gave a demonstration of the short takeoff and steep climb made possible by this extra thrust of over 8,000 pounds. The system took a great deal of effort to develop and when they had it absolutely perfected, it was cancelled, but then that's par for the course. In the Valiant, an emergency system and an extreme emergency system for lowering the undercarriage are provided. A selection of undercarriage down, we got three reds. And once again, chief, what shall we do? <laughs> it was simple physics, bank left, bank right, and throw the undercarriage down. We couldn't do that with the nose, so we had to touch down in a nose-up position and the jolt was enough to lock the leg down. It transpired that the batteries had boiled at the forward end of the bomb bay. The units in the organ loft, two of each failed. For cases of extreme emergency, when the emergency system just shown has failed, a hinged flap on top of the starboard console panel is lifted and the two switches under it are operated. 
These switches, one for each undercarriage, fire explosive bolts which attach the actuator mounting brackets to the undercarriage door and also attach the uplock mounting bracket to the structure. The wing clearing emergency release switch and extreme emergency release switch are located above the pilot's windscreen. We carried half our fuel in our underwing tanks. They devised a, a scheme by which you could actually jettison the fuel within the tanks very, very quickly indeed. There were three massive dump valves which you opened pneumatically. At the same time, you pressurized the underwing tanks using nitrogen. So the fuel was actually blasted out and you could get rid of something like 5,000 gallons in two minutes. Should the normal release system fail, the underwing tanks or additional bombs can be released electrically by operating the emergency wing clearing switch. Should this system also fail, the extreme emergency switch fires fuses which release them mechanically. Also on the center panel on the left hand side is the flap control emergency switch. It operates an emergency motor which in the event of failure of the main motor will either raise or lower the flaps at approximately one quarter the normal rate. It will not give an intermediate position. When abandoning the aircraft in flight, the ejector seat charges are fired by pulling the face blind handle. The pilot's canopy is fixed by 26 explosive bolts that are fired electrically. So be careful of the two canopy jettison levers located one by the side of each console panel. We will now permit the airman to demonstrate how to jettison the canopy in an emergency. Push the fingers under the hinged lid at the cutout part and pull the lever inside it upwards. The first part of the lever's travel fires the explosive charges in the canopy belts and hence jettisons the canopy. The last part of the lever's travel disengages the control column which, being spring-loaded, automatically moves forward clear of the pilot's legs. I suppose the biggest fear was that if you ever had to abandon the aircraft, uh, and it did happen, certainly with, to my knowledge, in the case of the Victor, they, they had some problem and they were forced to bail out quite low down, and the captain stayed at the controls and bailed out far too low for the rear crew members, because of course they didn't have ejector seats, so they had to go out through the door. It would have been impracticable, and be, the cost would have been too great to have fitted the three medium bombers with ejector seats for the rear crew. There are three emergency exits on the Valiant which can be used in the event of a crash landing or ditching. These are an elliptical hatch containing the window on the starboard side of the cabin, the entrance door on the port side and the sextant door. The only means of escape were for the three rear crew members depended on at least one pilot to hold the aircraft level whilst the rear escape door was opened by the AO or, or whichever a navigator got to it first. The windshield is released and protects the airman about to jump. This gave some shielding from the wind effect flowing past the entrance and then one just did a, a nose dive straight out of the aircraft. The sextant dome is removed by squeezing together the two pairs of handles mounted on the back rest tubes and pulling the dome inwards. The container for the inflatable dinghy and its auxiliary equipment is located aft of the cabin on the top of the fuselage. The dinghy is released by pulling the release handle in the cabin roof as far as it will go. I um, joined the Air Force on the 1st of November, 40. We uh, went on to a conversion school for, uh, with the Oxford. From there we went on to the uh, Wellington. Well, I went off to the uh, Middle East and then the Far East. Finally, for at the end of the time when the war finished, we um, had to carry on with the uh, Wellington, etc. It was all very stereotyped. We were just doing night cross countries, really. So in the end, I said, well, you see how that I, I wasn't really uh, paying my way, as it were. I'd like to make a change if we could. I'd like to go, I'd say, well, I'd like to go on the Vengeance, the dive bomber. 
and they were literally only down the road, the squadrons. In no time at all, I did a little bit of practice flying, as it were, on a local Harvard, and then went on to the, uh, the big fellow. And it was a big aeroplane, albeit it was only a single engine aeroplane, but it was a very big one. We went to war with that. It was a pure dive bomber, and uh, it was at its best when you have got the bomb doors open and the air brakes out, and you were going straight down. Really, you could just aim the aeroplane straight down, and you got over the top of the target and aimed yourself straight down at the target. At the appropriate height, you released your bombs, you pulled out, and away you went. And off I went on to Mosquito Instructor. On the same station, there was a unit which was um, doing conversion on meteors. And uh, Jock and I were talking one day and said, you know, we really ought to get ourselves some jet hours. We were getting a bit out of date. We had a quiet word with our friends down on the other squadron and uh, they converted us to the meteor. And now got our jet hours, at least to start with and not too long before we were on the Canberras. Like the Mosquito had been in its day, this was the same. It was new and it was smooth and uh, it did all the things that it was supposed to do. Quite straightforward. Then we had what was, we all referred to as the V-Force. Started with the uh, Valiant, then the uh, Victor and the Vulcan. I was fortunate in a little bit of, a, bit of flying on each, but they had most of the flying on the uh, Valiant in the beginning, quite early on. Again, that was on the same systems, it was, but it was a bigger aeroplane and it was half a dozen of us on board. Operation Grapple, the tests of the real thermonuclear weapons in the middle of the Pacific at Christmas Island, these were something quite remarkable because it was a totally British operation. The airfield was ready on time. The Americans, who in fact had had a lot of help by the British and other British Commonwealth physicists and scientists that create the atom bomb, they said, it is now ours, you can run away and play, we're not going to give you any further information on that, how we're developing thermonuclear weapons. We then had to do the testing ourselves, of course. This meant, among other things, changing the appearance of the Valiants. They had been in natural metal. They were painted with special anti-flash white paint, which reduced the flash effect, the temperature rise, Eight of these V-bombers were required, and well over a hundred special modifications had to be embodied in each. At the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment in Aldermaston, Britain's foremost scientists, under the leadership of Sir William Penny himself, redoubled their efforts to ensure the readiness and efficacy of the bomb and its test and control components. In order to achieve a clean bomb, and to contain its effects as far as possible, it had been decided to restrict the grapple series of tests to air bursts high above the Pacific Ocean. All bombing crews, therefore, were faced with the urgent requirement for great bombing accuracy, not only in air, but also in height. And this necessitated intensive training, first at Orford Ness, then Maralinga, and later in the Pacific Zone itself. And a thermonuclear explosion, you can't sort of half do it. It's got to be done properly. And this meant protecting the Valiant and protecting the two pilots. Christmas Island, a small atoll in the Pacific, was the base of the operation. Valiants, Shackletons and Canberras on the airstrip. Towards the end of January, the Shackletons began to fly in from coastal command. Two squadrons, 206 and 240, had been selected for low-level met reconnaissance, a sea search of the gravel area, and general transport and photographic duties. From a command, apart from number 49 squadron with the Valiants, provided number 76 squadron with the Canberra B6s and number 100 squadron with Canberra PR7s, all flown by volunteer crew. But pride of place in the entire operation went to the Vickers Valley. 
March saw the arrival of number 49 Squadron Bomber Command, again composed entirely of volunteer air crew. The first group to touch down were given a ceremonial welcome. A complete decker navigational system was installed with slave stations at Penryn and Jarvis and its headquarters on Christmas Island. Decker, with its hyperbolic grid of wireless waves radiated by ground stations and picked up, reproduced and correlated by internal instruments, the flight log, plots the aircraft's exact course and location and enables the pilot to fly with unerring accuracy to any predetermined point in space. In April 1957, the build-up of the air task group was completed. Early in May, the native workers and their families were evacuated by sea and air. They had worked hard and well, but now their part was over. The final phase was about to begin. With D-Day almost in sight, tension grew. Flyover trials had ended, and inert and high explosive drops were well advanced. These detailed rehearsals enabled every aspect of the operation to be checked and modified where necessary. The actual target was an uninhabited island called Malden Island, named after Malden in Surrey, London suburb, and Christmas Island was something like 200 miles away. May 1957. The installation of all recording and measuring apparatus was perfected. Ground instruments at Malden would record the size and scope of the explosion and measure blast effects, nuclear and heat radiation, and residual radioactivity. High-speed cameras would photograph the burst from beginning to end. On D-Day, the scientific director and his assistants would be within 30 miles of the test to observe and assess. On May the 10th came the full-scale operational rehearsal. The weapon groups, with RAF assistance, carried out assembly and loading behind security screens. The aircraft itself was tested by the now familiar fish fry here being wheeled under the tail pad. The bomb hoisting gantry moved into position. Meanwhile, air crew were carrying out the four flight checks prior to takeoff. Taking off from main base, the Valiant flew southwards to Malden, its course plotted and checked by the warrior's radar. In the forward area, it made contact with the control ships and commenced the trial run flying a racetrack pattern. Three runs were made. The first, to test the Valiant instruments. The second, to check on scientific instrumentation. And the third and last, to drop the practice weapon. At a pre-selected point in space, checked by the decometers and verified by the bomb aimers offset sites, for visual bombing was to be employed, the last rehearsal drop was successfully made and the aircraft returned to base. Before dawn, B-1, the first aircraft left on final weather check. Soon after daylight, the ground crew of Valiant 818 and associated scientific teams began the comprehensive preparations for bombing up. The uh, scientists looked after all that side of it and uh, the ground crew loaded it onto the aircraft. The boffins then set it up. Dawn on D-Day, May the 15th. All units were standing by. While bombing up was being completed, the crew of Valiant 818 received final instructions on the tarmac. Now the ultimate decision rested with the task force commander. During the day, scientists and service personnel were withdrawn from Malden and embarked in Narvik, Warrior and Messina. Now bombed up, the Valiant left her security screens and was towed carefully to a special parking position at the extreme end of the runway. This kept taxiing down to an absolute minimum. The Valiant's crew, skippered by Wing Commander Hubbard, went aboard the aircraft. Much could still happen that was unforeseeable, but within the bounds of human effort, all things had been checked, all possible safety measures taken. Target Island was now left to the bomb. Malden waited. At 8 hours minus 70 minutes, the Valiant was given the order to start engines. 
ten minutes later, into a clear Pacific sky, Valiant 818 took off safely. As it headed south from Alden Island, personnel dispersed from the safety lines. Within the aircraft, which flew at 45,000 feet, constant radio communication was kept on a selected frequency with JOC and the control ships, even at that late stage. Should any fault have developed or weather conditions unexpectedly have deteriorated, the operation would have had to be postponed. On decks in the forward area, observers dressed in protective clothing awaited the sight of the valiant. Throughout, the bomber was shadowed by a second valiant, which flew in open formation below and behind its leader. This grandstand aircraft gave a duplicate crew the advantage of full operating experience during the live drop of a megaton weapon. Their approach was plotted by the warrior's radar. In the warrior control room, all naval ships in the forward area were constantly checked for position. In less than an hour, the Valiants reached the rendezvous point, 75 miles north of Malta. The bomber turned north to assume position for her live approach. In ships below, personnel sat with backs turned to the point of first hands covering their eyes. Hello, Valiant 818. We are now taking you over. Can you hear me? Receiving you loud and clear, over. Good luck. Uh, thank you, and same to you. Bomb doors open. Minus 75 seconds. Here, the blackout screens for aircrew protection had been temporarily removed to enable this photographic record to be made. Minus 60 seconds. Telemetry to internal. Minus 50 seconds. Steady on 203. 203. 204. Zero four, steady. Two zero three. Two zero three. After the weapon had been released, there would be a lapse of some 40 seconds before the actual explosion to allow the dropping aircraft to escape. Minus 20 seconds. Two zero two. Two zero two. then release the great weapon and immediately enter a maximum rate turn. We released the bomb and then did a, a manoeuvre to turn out of the way so that our tail was towards the release when it burst. And you would turn onto reciprocal and go back the way you came and like that you would put the maximum distance between you and the explosion. And we'd recording equipment in the back of the I'm from the tail end of the aeroplane looking at this. There was now only 30 seconds before the birth. Minus 30 seconds. But there were two code names, secret code names at the time. 20. One of them was Blue Boar and the other one was Blue Danube, I believe. 15. Uh, these were free fall thermonuclear 10. bombs and the Valiant was the only aircraft available to test them in free fall. Five, four, three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Open eyes.
and we had lots of Canberras with special instrumentation so that when the bomb had been dropped over Malden Island, the Canberras could fly through the, the cloud and sample all the radioactivity. This primary sampler had remained within the area of burst for 45 minutes, flying in and out of the cloud itself. The crew were assisted out of the aircraft to ensure that no point of their body touched outside surfaces which were highly contaminated. Wearing shields on their feet to prevent any possible transfer of radioactivity to the ground on which they walked, they made their way to the decontamination center. Initial samples were now taken out by specially trained crews who extracted the filters from wingtip tanks. It is interesting to record that no one suffered by contamination and that no single item of equipment sustained unforeseen effects. On Christmas Island, the Mid-Pacific News scooped the world press in being first with the news. Further successful detonations followed on May the 31st and June the 19th. Yeah, we dropped seven devices and I did the last one. The bang was different and there were two bangs. One was the result of the explosion, and the second was a reflected one, because these were weapons were released and burst above ground, and the uh, concussion went down and reflected back to us. So we got two, a big one and a small one. The aircraft instruments wobbled about a bit, but that was the only the pressure change that was causing this. And uh, once the explosion was over, it tapered off and uh, went back to normal again. The explosion of Britain's first thermonuclear device was the equivalent of a million tons or more of TNT. The stroke surpassing Bomber Command's total bombing of Germany in World War II. It's true, of course, that the H-bomb makes a terrifying impact on the mind of man. It may well prove to be man's greatest hope for peace. It offers perhaps the ultimate deterrent. For surely only a madman deliberately courting certain destruction in reprisal, would dare to initiate an all-out nuclear war. One of the areas where Britain was a world leader was in air refuelling. By the 1950s, we had what we called the probe and drogue scheme. Developed after years of intensive experiment by Sir Alan Cobham. A Lincoln bomber acts as a tanker and a meteor takes on the fuel at about 250 gallons a minute. An automatic cutoff prevents loss of fuel when the two aircraft separate. You had to fly very accurately to push the probe into the drogue and if you did it correctly you got a fuel type joint. The tanker could then pass fuel into the receiver aircraft and, in theory, you could pretty well double its range. Not long after I arrived on 90 Squadron, it was announced that the squadron would be converting to in-flight refuelling, to be the second of the in-flight refuelling squadrons. The first in-flight refu refuelling squadron had been based at Marham, and that was 214 Squadron. And they did all the development work when the flight refuelling concept was first initiated long distance trips from UK to Singapore non-stop. Before you were checked out as a tanker, you had to be fully checked out as a receiver as well. And that added tremendous flexibility to the whole fleet, the fact that tankers could actually receive fuel as well as give. The uh, giving of fuel was no problem. You just flew along straight and level, steadily. The basket, the end of the hose, was deployed from the bomb bay because the bomb bay was equipped with a thing called an HDU, the hose drum unit and the hose would be unwound and would be at full trail and then the receiver aeroplane would come along and engage and then the fuels would pass. The action of coupling would open the various valves automatically and the fuel would flow. The difficult bit was when you were, the, when you were going to be the receiver because it was you that had to do all this. And the first time I was shown it, I thought there is no way at all I'm going to be able to do this. I could not hold station behind the drogue uh, it was all over the place. Uh, one minute be up here, then down there. And um, eventually one instructor 
said, what you want to do is, if you decide that you need a certain selection of aileron, for example, put it on and immediately take it off, even before you see the effect of that aileron have effect. And that was the trick. If the drogue was out here, you'd apply the appropriate amount of aileron and immediately take it off. And sure enough, the, 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 the drogue would seem to move into the, exactly the right position. And you applied power to, to um, fly up the line of the hose. And as soon as you saw it, saw that you were advancing towards, you took the power off again. And the inertia of the aircraft carried it on into the drogue. It was a knack, absolutely amazing. Uh, I had two terrible missions where I couldn't get anywhere near. And then on the third mission, suddenly it clicked. And I did 22 consecutive contacts, one after the other as if nothing, as if I'd been doing it all my life. It was an extraordinary experience. My crew were delighted because <laughs> I was, they were entirely in my hands for this particular maneuver. In the back, we had three crew members that faced the rear of the aircraft. Uh, the center one was the navigator. On his right, I, that's to say on the aircraft left, would be the electronics officer. He was very much a, a part, he was a signaler. He, it was all Morse code and and all the electronic side of things. And the, the remaining uh, crew member who's, who sat on the navigator's left, he would be the, the, the radar operator. And although he had a radar, his, his new job was to work all the controls for the flight refueling equipment. The airflow uh, dragged the drogue out at a certain speed. And then when it reached the full extent of the hose, it would obviously stop. The receiver would come up and engage with the drogue and of course, what you needed was a balanced hose. So that's to say the receiver is pressing on the drogue and therefore the, the hose now wants to wind back onto the drum. The airflow pulling it out and the receiver pushing it in by, by means of this hydraulic clutch, you kept it in equilibrium. What the receiver had to do was simply wind on a certain amount of uh, footage back onto the drum and to help him, there would be lines at 10 foot intervals all the way up the drogue. Most receiver aeroplanes would have a, a ring main system so that the co-pilot of the receiver aircraft selected into which tanks and in what sequence the fuel that was entering the aircraft would, would be um, positioned. Otherwise the aircraft might very well go out of trim. The Valiant squadrons all practiced air refueling. Now for Cape Town. The bomb doors emergency control switch is on the right hand forward corner of the center panel. Pressing the switch raises the deflector, opens the bomb doors, and then jettisons the bombs. In Valiant, you had to um, open the bomb doors, then open the deflector, then you could close the bomb doors, leaving the deflector open. And this particular day, this had been done because um, they'd found there was a fault on the fuel gauges. I jumped into the bomb bay, and there were practice bombs bombed up, ready for their next sortie. I crawled underneath them to the adjusting points of the fuel gauges and adjusted the fuel gauges with the aid of a colleague who was in the cockpit. We were connected up on the intercom. When he had said that the gauges were satisfactorily adjusted and everything was working all right, he jumped out of the aircraft yelling to Chiefy to close the aircraft down because um, we were finished. Well, and I was still putting the panels on inside the aircraft, inside the bomb bay. Chiefy didn't bother to check and he just closed the deflector down and went off to lunch. Made myself as comfortable as I could amongst these bombs that were in the bomb bay, and um, fell asleep. When the gen everybody came back to fly or take the aircraft off, I didn't hear them until they started up the engines. So I frantically opened up the instrument panel, removed the wires to the fuel gauges so that they had to stop, and um, they opened the bomb bay doors to find out what happened. I fell out, and everybody thought it was hilarious. If I hadn't pulled those wires off, the aircraft would have taxied away and taxied off. There was no way I could attract anybody else's attention. And I'd have been flying off at high altitude, frozen, 
solid, died, and possibly when they opened the bomb, by, bomb doors, dropped as a bomb onto the target and found a couple of pounds of strawberry jam, I suppose. During the 1950s, the intercontinental ballistic missile came on a pace. You couldn't do anything about it, you couldn't stop it, you couldn't shoot it down, and you only had a few minutes warning. So we thought, what will any nasty enemy aim at first? Well, they will aim at our own striking capability. And what's that? Why, Valiant squadrons. Now, the Valiants couldn't be hidden away in a silo or in a, a, a deep hole in the ground for missiles. So we tried to disperse our Valiants to all sorts of airfields where there was a decent runway. And we also practiced what was called quick reaction alert. Uh, for the QRA, what used to happen was that you were rostered uh, on a particular day and you spent uh, 24 hours on on quick reaction alert, which is what QRA stand, stood for. And uh, you went into this sort of uh, bunker arrangement where you had your own catering, your own sleeping accommodation, and you lived in your flying suit. And every now and then, the, the Bomber Command controller would actually launch you. The sirens would go, or a bell, or a, a gong, or something, and the chaps would run out, get into their aircraft. When you climbed in your seat, you strapped yourself in, and everything was all ready, so all you had to do was just start the engines, open the throttles, and away you went. There was no, no pre-flight checks to done, because you'd already done those in, in, in advance. And they would scramble in the shortest possible time. The uh, whole system was that you had to be airborne within four minutes. And uh, we used to practice that. And one of the crew chiefs in the V-Force designed a system where you could start all four engines at the same time, instead of individually, which was the case until then. Of course, that shortened the time tremendously. On QRA, everything you did, you had to do as quickly as you possibly could. Part of the procedure was to open the nose cap on the underwing fuel tank and to turn on the nitrogen valve to pressurize the tank. This took the time necessary to open the nose cap, reach inside, turn it on, put the nose cap back on, secure the two fasteners. I found that two and a half turns turned it on. So I worked on a couple of spare pulley wheels and I turned them in, in literally into pulley wheels instead of hand wheels. And by drilling a hole and threading a plug and cord around the wheel, I could turn the, the thing on, I could turn the valve on. And by drilling one little hole in the nose cap, I could do it from without needing to remove the nose cap. So that cut quite a large number of seconds off the time for me to turn on my nitrogen valve. This device, which was invented by one of the crew chiefs, was external batteries. Uh, because you couldn't have done it on the internal battery. You had an external battery which was uh, connected up and uh, you could start off 4, 3, 2, 1. Maybe. And so in no time at all, you had four engines, four mighty avions going in the case of the, uh, the van and away you went. My aeroplane was selected as the opponent of a sim start system. I planned with my pilot that we would start the four engines one at a time as quickly as possible so that as the amperage peaked on the hooch in the power set I would call for the next engine to start. So that's what we did. We started one engine as the amperage peaked. I called for the next engine, he selected the next engine and so on for all four engines. And then I removed the single plug from the aircraft and shut, and shut my panel. The SimStart aircraft had a much more complicated system where he would have to start his four engines, then he would have to remove the leads from the aircraft, and then he would have to do up one of the large panels which we use for recharging the oxygen and nitrogen. My aircraft with its, with its simpler system of turning on the wing tanks, the underwing tanks, and the much more rapid removal of the power set enabled me to get the chocks pulled away from my aeroplane while he was still fastening up his <laughs> sim start panel. And we actually beat his taxi time. 
And it was always quite impressive to have four V-bombers from the, if you like, the flag dropping to be in the air within four minutes. This V-bomber scramble shows the speed with which Bomber Command is able to get a deterrent force into the air. Four aircraft airborne in under two minutes. Four, four mighty V-bombs, and of course it applied to the Victors and the Vulcans as well. My aircraft could be on its way to the end of the runway within the four minutes, but it was the thought of any aeroplane trying to humiliate my aeroplane by making it seem slower than they were. And that was not acceptable. <laughs> this was supposed to be proof against the retaliatory force, the valiance with nuclear weapons, being destroyed on the ground by missiles. And everything came to a, a bit of a head uh, at the time of the, of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when really we thought, hmm, this is getting a bit serious. American intelligence had proved that the Russians were establishing a series of missile bases on the island of Cuba, which was within a very short distance of the United States. And President Kennedy issued an ultimatum. This is Thomas H. Wolfe in Washington. An atmosphere of calm determination prevails today throughout the United States and reportedly throughout all the nations of the Western Hemisphere. As the United States begins to make effective a quarantine to prevent the delivery to Cuba of any further offensive military equipment from the Soviet Union. Point number one calls for the immediate dismantling and withdrawal from Cuba of all missiles and all other weapons with offensive capabilities. In his speech Monday night, Mr. Kennedy clearly spelled out that the United States action was being taken because, as the president phrased it, of, quote, unmistakable evidence, unquote, that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation in Cuba. Missile sites whose purpose, the president said, quote, can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. The ships that were have been observed approaching Cuba carrying these missiles were, were going to be sunk unless they turned back. Mr. Kennedy pointed out that it was Cuba and the Soviet Union who were responsible for the bellicose buildup. Mr. Kennedy emphasized that aggressive actions by the Soviet Union had tremendously increased the threat of war, war which, of necessity, would lay open all the world to nuclear destruction. Well, strangely enough, at the back of one's mind, one thought, well, surely this isn't going to happen. We'd been training for it f ever since I'd been in the V Force, of course, but somehow or other, I was pretty confident that, that common sense would prevail and that we wouldn't be launched to take out whole cities of, uh, of, in, in, in Russia, which was uh, really quite a frightening prospect, I have to say. Officials state that the U.S. knows of 24 Soviet rocket bases in Cuba. We could hear the haggling about the, the, the missiles going into Cuba and President Kennedy wanting them out and the possibility of a strike being made uh, in which case the aeroplanes would go and probably not be able to come back. That the United States wants a peaceful solution was emphasized by President Kennedy's direct appeal to Chairman Khrushchev. Of course we realized that this was probably the first time since we've actually been in the, in the V-Force, so certainly I'd been in the V-Force, that we were really in the situation was becoming very serious indeed. And this might be the crunch point where things would happen. Every day you did the, the checks, the pilots and the crew would come out and they'd operate the aircraft systems and you'd be linked to the bomber controller and you'd hear the message, exercise Edom for bomber crews only. This is a practice scramble. The aeroplanes would start and go uh, to the runway but it, it was practice and you're waiting for the day when they said exercise this is not a practice scramble and uh, we were waiting 
at the end of the runway for World War III to uh, start. And so the issue is clear. The Soviets can end this crisis by the prompt dismantling and removing of offensive weapons in Cuba. And around the world, men and women today hope that they will do so. Fortunately, the Russian ships did in fact turn around and that defused the whole situation. And so we were stood down. But it was quite uh, an interesting time, I have to say. This is the briefing room of one of our V-bomber stations, where the crew of a Valiant are getting the final details of a carefully planned exercise from the wing commander. Over the UK, the RAF flew navigational bombing exercises where every emphasis was placed on the use of countermeasures, the absolute precision in navigation, and by electronic means, dropping theoretical bombs which could then be scored. You could say you were 50 feet off or 100 feet off. To be a bomb aimer, one had to learn the Mark 14 bomb site, which was the visual bomb site, that being the only bomb site available. Bomb aiming is, in, in fact, an extension of the normal problems of flight planning, DR navigation, etc., leading into the final product of dropping a bomb using the same principles that apply to uh, navigation. All the bombing that was done from the V-bomb and the V-force was done by radar. The MBS system would be used on a, on a wartime row to take us through from leaving base to getting to the target and releasing the weapon, a nuclear weapon, on the MBS. We got to a stage where you could put a nuclear weapon on the corner of a building. I don't think we made any plans at all to drop bombs visually in, uh, in an operational configuration. Consequently, all our planning was, was based on operating the Valiant as a uh, blind bomber. We performed in the night roll with uh, Astra navigation. We finished some uh, uh, navigation competitions with an accuracy of two to three miles, having completed an uh, Astra navigation run of some 1,600 miles completely on, on Astra navigation. And of course the Americans from Strategic Air Command used to come and compete against us. And of course they were, they were forced, certainly forced to be reckoned with. We had an interchange. I mean we had bombing competitions every year in this country. And we used to invite an American wing, say four, air, four aircraft, to come and participate. The only really challenging operations were to take part in the American bombing competitions which used to take place, I think, annually. The whole of Strategic Air Command had to send their best crews. And we got in the habit of sending, I believe, one or two Valiants, and then later, uh, a number of Vulcans. It was just superlative. We were, we were treated as the Americans treated their SAC crews, treated like lords. I forget the motto, but SAC is our insurance. They meant their insurance against attack from the Russians in the east. The Valiants certainly didn't disgrace themselves. There were eight crews selected from number three group who flew one mission each out of 146 total crews. We had two teams of four, an A team and a B team. And both our teams came in the first 20th position. One team came seventh, and the other team came twentieth. And the reason that they came twentieth was that uh, one crew lost the use of its radar beam. Uh, the aerial misfunctioned, and uh, they were unable to carry out any uh, bombing runs at all. But I have, in, in fact, a document in my possession saying that uh, we had achieved the same status as SAC and that the, the eight crews put in the creditable performance, which we should be proud of. The winners tended to be people who'd been practicing over the same area for years, which is what you'd expect. They were trying to prove to themselves and to the Americans, I think, that the Americans were not above us. We were on a par with them, as we always bloody well knew. We, we would never admit to the Americans being better than us. Really, you know, you wouldn't. 
but it was very good training, very good practice, and also uh, I think showed the Americans that we also could play play our part. Jane, you were out in the back here when the plane came down, weren't you? Yes, I was out feeding my cat, <laughs> just inside the back door. And was the plane burning? Did you say uh, so? It exploded in the air just above the house. So we've had a fairly narrow escape here. Yeah? Well, certainly have. I'm really lucky to be alive. Just taken off in the early hours of the morning on its way to somewhere. It was one of the in-flight refueling aeroplanes. It was directly after the crash and that sort of thing, everything was flame and smoke. And it's said that the, the problem was that the elevator trimmer was operated electrically from a switch on the control column. You, you tended to trim it in short, sharp bursts, little blips on the, on the switch. Sometimes there was some problem and the trimmer would run away to, the, to its full travel, which of course made the aircraft effectively uncontrollable. Every now and then they'd spring this on us in the simulator. And it was possible for the two of you to actually hold the aircraft. But you had to have your wits about you and you had to be sort of half expecting it, which of course in the simulator you were. Whether you'd be as quick at identifying it at two o'clock in the morning on a, on a dark night, that is another matter. But there were certainly, to my knowledge, two or three or maybe more valiants lost as a result of a runaway trim. And what's your cat think of all this? <laughs> he hasn't shown up yet. We doubt whether he will. <laughs> Whereas in the 1950s, all the effort was on flying higher to get away from missiles, by the 1960s, the missiles had won. Uh, once the word went out, I had chaps, we've got to fly low. You've got to fly at, what shall we say, 200 feet? Now, a Valiant at full throttle at 200 feet has a very rough ride indeed. And this did the wings a power of no good. The aircraft was not designed, not like the black, that Valiant B Mark II, it was not designed for maximum speed at sea level. So they began to crack, and thank heavens we discovered the cracking before any wing came off. Uh, it meant a new wing, and the answer was, ditch the valiance, it's just not worth building a new wing. And the word went out one day, enough chaps, all the valiants are grounded. To me, she, she was the best thing that's ever flown until Concorde came along. The aeroplane supported me in what I was trying to do, which was to be the best that I possibly could be. I have never, ever flown in a Bomber Command bomber in an operational capacity or otherwise that I have learned to rely on as much as I did with the Valiant. It was heavy. It was smooth, it was a good aeroplane, but then flying the Victor and the Vulcan after that, I'd say they were the same. I found it a, a, a delightful aircraft. It was a bit uh, down on speed compared with the other two V-bombers, the Victor and the Vulcan. I think I liked the Valiant the best, you know, but that was because it was the first, I suspect. Mm. The, the, the Valiant, of course, was a bit of a stopgap aircraft, wasn't it? It was, it was the first one to come online. And it, I think that it was ordered because the other two would be such a long time coming online, they thought they'd better have an aircraft capable of fulfilling the task that would come into service a good deal earlier than the Vulcan and the Victor. In my opinion, it was the, the finest aeroplane that I ever worked on because I had a relationship with that aeroplane and with the crew that flew regularly with it. Overall, the importance of the Valiant is that in those days we had a powerful national, all-British aircraft industry which could do any task that it was set. And as I've said, we made 108 Valiants very quickly indeed. They were excellent aeroplanes for their time. They could do, well, pretty near everything that a B-52 could do, except they couldn't fly quite so far and they were extremely reliable in service. They were outstanding value for money. And if only they had been structurally designed for low level, like the Valiant Mark II was, who knows, we might even have some in service now. It was a good bummer.